Now, is that talking about a long period of time, or is that also just one day? I don't know. I think that's just one day also. But certainly when it says evening and morning and the first day, the second day, there is no reason to say these days are anything other than 24-hour days, just like we have today. No verses in the Bible where the word yam is used indicate anything other than a 24-hour day. Get the Gap Theory book if you want to go down deep on that one, okay? Or my little booklet, The Gap Theory. James Hutton wrote a book in 1795, and people began to think the earth is millions of years old. Thomas Chalmers entered the, invented the gap theory to try to fit that into the Bible, and it's been swallowed by Christians ever since. It's not scriptural. And Darwin's book came out in 1859, and by then Christians had already accepted the idea that the earth is millions of years old. And so there was really no effective resistance to the evolution theory when it came out. The Christians didn't even fight against Darwin's theory because they'd already accepted the age of the earth as being billions of years old. That's why I say it's a dangerous, dangerous heresy, okay? And today, 75% of kids from Christian homes that go to public schools are going to reject the Christian faith, mostly because of this great age of the earth issue, which we covered yesterday. How to prove the earth is not billions of years old. Hugh Ross, of course, teaches each of the days are long periods of time. He's got a, re a website, Reasons to Believe. I debated him for three hours on the John Ankerberg Show. He won't do it again. I'll debate him anytime, anywhere. He's an extremely smart man. I'm sure he's a very sincere man, loves the Lord. I wouldn't question that. But he's wrong in what he believes. And just because somebody's nice and smiles and very smart doesn't mean they're right. Okay? <laughs> Compare Scripture with Scripture. Search the Scriptures. Okay, See if these things are so. So Genesis chapter 1 says, Let there be a firmament in the midst of the waters, and let it divide the waters from the waters. Well, what is a firmament? Some people say it must be the dirt, you know, because the dirt keeps the water away from the water. No, it's not the dirt. Read down, verse number 20, and it says the fowls, that's the birds, fly above the earth in the open firmament of heaven. The birds fly in the firmament. The birds do not fly in the dirt. Okay, the birds fly in the air. So the first heaven is telling us right here is where the birds fly, okay? The scripture interprets itself, okay? Second heaven is where the sun, moon, and stars are. God said, let there be lights in the firmament. Talks about the sun, moon, and stars. That's the second heaven. The third heaven is only mentioned once in the Bible, right here, 2 Corinthians chapter 12. The Apostle Paul is telling the story about the time he got rocked to sleep. I mean, uh, stoned to death. And he said he was caught up to the third heaven. Three heavens mentioned in the Bible. First heaven where the birds fly. Second heaven where the stars are. Third heaven where God lives. We're going to go up there one of these days. We're going to hear a trumpet blast. Doo -doo -doo. Lutherans take off first, you know, dead in Christ, rise first. And then we're going to take a bite off the Milky Way and end up going to the third heaven. Mm -hmm. They're going to be there soon. Okay. Psalm 19 talks about the heavens, plural, declare the glory of God. Heavens. Remember Genesis 1.1, it's heaven singular. Then he divides it up into three slices. First heaven, second heaven, third heaven. Heavens declare the glory of God. Verse 7 says, God made the firmament and divided the waters which were under the firmament from the waters which were above the firmament. Now, wait a minute. Is he telling us there was water above where the birds fly? Psalm 148 says, Praise him, ye waters that be above the heavens. Maybe there is still water beyond outer space. The Bible says the Lord sits on many waters. Maybe this whole thing that we see, this huge universe with all these bazillions of stars, maybe the whole thing is surrounded by water, that's the only verse I've got to back up this theory. But maybe everything we see is all, one, is all inside one of them little glass balls on God's dresser that you pick up and you shake once in a while, you know, and the snowflakes float around, you know. And God says, how are you all doing in there? Here you go. <laughs> so first, uh, second Peter tells us, the earth was standing out of the water and in the water. Apparently, when God first made the earth, there was a canopy of water or ice above the atmosphere. It's not there now. It all fell down at the time of the flood. But Isaiah tells us, the Lord sits on the circle of the earth. <laughs> Interesting. 3,000 years ago, the Bible said the earth is round. Christians have never taught the earth is flat. Some heathens have believed that and tried to blame it on the Christians. But we've always known the earth is round. But then it says, he stretched out the heavens. 17 times in the Bible, it says he stretches out the heavens. Maybe that's why we have a red shift in astronomy. And people say, how did the light get from the stars to here? Oh, you got it all backwards. The Bible says God made the earth first and then the stars. 
So the question is, how did the stars get from here to there, not how did the light get from there to here? Cover more on that on video 7. But he stretched out the heavens. Interesting. Today's atmosphere that we're breathing has six layers. Troposphere, stratosphere, mesosphere, thermosphere, exosphere, and ionosphere. There used to be a seventh layer. It was a layer of water or ice above the atmosphere. I don't know what it was because it's gone now. Okay, All we can do is make a theory about it. This is called the canopy theory, which says there was a layer of water or ice, probably ice, above the atmosphere. I happen to believe it's probably 10 or 20 inches of ice, super cold ice, suspended by the magnetic field. You know how a magnet can float on top of another magnet? It's called the Meissner effect. We cover more on that in video 6. But the Earth could have had a canopy of ice suspended in the magnetic field, which would float it above the Earth. This ice or water would block out UV light, some of it. It would increase air pressure. Today the air is about 100 miles thick. It would squeeze it all down probably to 10 or 20 miles and double the air pressure on the surface. By the way, when the space shuttle blasts off and leaves all that exhaust behind, it's forming ice clouds and the ice clouds float to the North and South Pole and hover there about 50 miles above the Arctic. Ice clouds that are floating, they won't fall. Apparently stuck in the magnetic field, I don't know. But article about that here. Josephus wrote in his book that the Hebrews believed when God made the earth on the second day, he placed a crystalline firmament around it. A crystalline firmament. Probably super cold ice, okay? There was not only a canopy of water above the earth, there was water in the crust of the earth. Psalm 24 says, The earth is the Lord's. He founded it upon the seas and established it upon the floods. See, most of the water that's now in the oceans used to be in the crust of the earth. Psalm 136 says, He stretched out the earth above the waters. It's not the way it is today. I believe the original creation had a layer of water above, maybe 10 or 20 inches, who knows, of ice probably, and then a layer of air to breathe, probably 10 or 20 miles, I don't know, and then dirt and rocks to stand on, the crust of the earth, which we still have, but inside the crust of the earth, there was water. That's the water that came shooting to the surface when the fountains of the deep broke open. By the way, there is still lots of water in the crust of the earth, otherwise you could not have hot water vents shooting up into the bottom of the ocean. If you have hot water squirting up into the bottom of the ocean, where does it have to be coming from? Lower than that, doesn't it? Still huge hot water vents in the bottom of the ocean. I think some of that water is still coming out. We cover more on that in the hydroplate theory on video 6. But I think the earth today still has cracks where it broke open at the time of the flood. I taught earth science for years. The earth is broken up into plates, there's no question. I've been to the San Andreas Fault, the Hayward Fault, the New Madrid Fault, the Golden Fault. None of them are my fault, but I've been there, okay? There's no question, there are cracks in the Earth's crust, and when they move around, buildings fall down. It's called earthquakes, okay? Or tsunamis happen from the, from the underwater landslides and turbidity currents. There's no question the Earth is broken up, and there's no question the plates are still moving. The question is, when did all this happen? Now, the evolutionist will tell you this happened over millions and millions of years. The creationist says, no, all this catastrophe probably started at the time of that flood when the fountains of the deep broke open. That's what caused the fault lines. And the water went shooting to the surface, and it's still here today. I was debating an atheist one time, and during Q&A time, this student stood up and said, Hovind, where'd all the water from the flood go? I said, oh, it's still here. I said, the oceans are huge. There's enough water in the oceans. If you smoothed out the earth, it would cover the earth a mile and a half deep everywhere. I flew back over to Pacific from Australia. I told one of the guys in my office, I said, man, that Pacific Ocean is huge. He said, oh, that's just the top of it. <laughs> what a thought. <laughs> These hot water vents are proof there's water in the crust of the earth still squirting up. Probably most of it's gone now, it's on the surface. But this canopy of water that used to be there in the original creation would make the whole earth like a big greenhouse. How many know what a greenhouse is? They've got all glass walls you have to dress in the basement if you live in a greenhouse. Well, scientists are still finding lots of water in space between the stars. There's lots of water out in space. Interesting cover more on that later. And they've got a new theory now that says maybe a lack of oxygen killed the dinosaurs. A lack of oxygen? Why would they say that? Well, they had a big symposium in 1993. A bunch of scientists got together to study the apatosaurus. And they said, folks, we've got a problem. An 80-foot apatosaurus had nostrils the same size as a horse. How is an 80-foot animal going to get enough air through nostrils the same size as a horse. He'd be sucking so hard trying to get a breath, he'd set him on fire from the friction from the wind whistling in there. <clears throat> they couldn't breathe. 
Well, apparently they did breathe because bones of dinosaurs are found all over the planet. Even in Antarctica and Alaska. I mean, dinosaurs lived everywhere, okay? So how could an 80-foot animal get enough air? Well, today he probably couldn't, not to get 80 feet long. But I think before the flood came, they had this canopy of air or of water or ice that would increase air pressure. Plus, they had richer oxygen. You know, when they drill into the amber, how many saw the movie Jurassic Park, you know, where they drilled in to get the mosquito blood out? Sometimes in amber, which is petrified tree sap, they find air bubbles in the amber. When they analyze the air bubbles, they find out they're 50% more oxygen than we have today. Today we're breathing 21% oxygen. Amber bubbles have 32% oxygen. Did you know if you lived in a world with double the air pressure and 50% more oxygen, just breathing would be exciting.